Data collected since 1913 when the income tax amendment was passed would show us that wealth inequality or who has what is currently at roaring 20s levels. Yeah, that ended well. I guess that means that the richest Americans ever are walking around Wall Street today, right? Wrong. Only one is alive today and the others never even got to see the atomic age. So, who are the 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of all Americans that ever lived? Well, get out your formal wear, because today's class is high class. How high? I ain't talking black necktie, I'm talking black ascot. You think pigs in a blanket ain't classy? Try truffle pigs in a blanket. The five richest Americans ever. Now note that these numbers have been adjusted for inflation because a million dollars back when Marty McFly fought Buford Mad Dog Tannen would be worth 2.5 billion today. So let's go. Number five, John Jacob Astor at 121 billion. JJ immigrated to the US just after the revolution. Upon arrival, he opened a fur and musical instrument shop. And like chicken and waffles, this juxtaposition became incredibly successful, albeit mainly due to the furs. JJ knew how to work the system, taking advantage of Jay's treaty, which kept Canadian courier de Bois out of the US territory, started the earliest United States settlement on the Pacific coast, and was one of the first Americans to trade with China. He he created a monopoly on American fur without ever personally setting a trap. JJ also knew the value of a diversified portfolio. He saw New York City as the next great city of the world and started buying it up. How much did he buy? American National Biography that I'm looking in, it says that he spent over $2 million in land deals acquiring urban and agricultural uh, properties. He owned $2.5 billion worth of Manhattan, in today's money, yeah, Manhattan real yeah. estate. All right, thank well. you so much. You're very welcome. Now, when a studio apartment in the village rents for $2,600 a month now, you can imagine how much his holdings would be worth today. And the fortune would stay with the Astor family. His great-grandson, John Astor IV, might have been the richest person in the world in 1912, and was definitely the richest person to die on the Titanic. If you're watching this, there's a 91.7% chance that you're familiar with the works of our number four, Bill Gates, who peaked at 136 billion. The only living member of our Filthy Rich Five, Bill Gates is debatably the face of the computer revolution. Gates was one of the first to really see the potential of the PC as both a one-day household necessity and a way to hack into school computers to make sure all your classes contained hot chicks, which he totally did. With his partner Paul Allen, he started Microsoft in 1975 and went to work for MITS and IBM before striking it out on their own. Gates as an employer at times could make Frank Cross look like, well, Frank Cross at the end of the movie. He was verbally abusive, belittling, and generally couldn't understand how the rest of the room wasn't a once-in-a-lifetime genius like himself. Microsoft was also found to have an illegal monopoly due to the fact that every edition of Windows came with Internet Explorer, or your mom's web browser. Remember, a monopoly is when you have exclusive control of a supply or trade. And like many of the all-time earners, Gates, post-Microsoft, has dedicated himself to philanthropy, donating $30 billion to charity with the eventual goal of giving away 95% of his wealth before he hits that blue screen of death. And number three, Cornelius Vanderbilt at 185 billion. No, that's Yukon Cornelius. Wait, what if it's Yukon Cornelius Vanderbilt? Nah, they have to be two separate people because Yukon Cornelius made his fortune with silver and gold and peppermint, where Cornelius Vanderbilt was a railroad man. Eventually. Corny was born in New York to poor, literate parents and saved up to buy a sailboat at age 16. From that one boat, he eventually created a ferry and later steamboat empire while working for Thomas Gibbons. If that name sounds familiar, it's because this is the same Gibbons of Gibbons vs. Ogden, which resulted in the Supreme Court decision saying that only the federal government had the power to regulate interstate trade. By 1840, he entered the railroad game, quickly buying up railways like he was playing Monopoly. While that may not seem like much today, for a good hundred years they were the vital veins for transportation of trade. His son, William Vanderbilt, expanded the empire further, showing little regard for the common man, saying, The public be damned, and was a giant of what we called the Gilded Age. The golden gleam of the gilded surface hides the cheapness of the metal underneath. From this Mark Twain quote comes the name Gilded Age, which describes America post-Civil War till century's end. This was an era of incredible economic prosperity, while at the same time, awful abuses of workers and minorities. Our next two entries are products of the Gilded Age and in a league of their own. Number two, Andrew Carnegie at 309 billion. 
How do you get to be Andrew Carnegie? Steal, steal, steal. And with two E's. Born in Scotland and immigrating in 1848, Carnegie made connections as a telegraph boy and quickly worked his way up to being head of a major rail system. But his real fortune came from steel. He adapted the Bessemer process of steel making to create the most affordable metal around for rails and buildings and bridges and anything else that you didn't want to fall down. He also pioneered vertical integration, which meant he controlled the mining, moving, melting, and molding of his U.S. steel, keeping everything in-house. Now this didn't always translate into better conditions for his employees. After a particularly profitable year, his workers in Homestead, Pennsylvania wanted a reasonable wage increase. Carney was in Scotland at the time and his partner, Henry Clay Frick, sent in private security Pinkertons to bust up a strike, resulting in 10 deaths and one of America's first major union clashes. Still, he's regarded as a legendary philanthropist. He said you should spend the first third of your life educating yourself, the middle third getting all the money that you can, and the final third giving it all away. Now before we get to the original Mr. Burns, here's a couple of quick hits. Richest U.S. President? George Washington, who could afford 525 million portraits of himself. Current richest person? Mexican telecommunication magnate Carlos Slim Helu at 69 billion. That's it? That's chump change. Current poorest person, or at least most indebted? Jerome Caviar. This French illegal trader was sentenced to three years and fined 6.3 billion dollars, which may affect his future paychecks for the next 300,000 years. And the richest person to ever live? Mansa Musa at 400 billion. This king of Mali gave away so much gold that he single-handedly created a devastating 10-year inflation in Cairo, Medina, and Mecca. And number one on our list of richest Americans ever? John D. Rockefeller at 336 billion. The object of Gordon Gekko's wet dreams and Occupy Wall Street's worst nightmare, Rockefeller is the pinnacle of American wealth. Seriously, if he made it rain at a rate of $20 per second, it would continually rain for 532 years. Dude was Scrooge McDuck, minus the freestyle gold swimming. Son to a vagabond lumberjack slash snake oil salesman, his original goal was to make $100,000 and live 100 years. He almost did both. As the head of Standard Oil, he borrowed and reinvested to make the largest refinery business in the world and made Cleveland relevant. His competition begged to be bought out, and he had numerous politicians in his pockets. He drank your milkshake. His trust, which is an arrangement in which multiple companies give their shares to a single set of trustees, would finally be busted by Ida Tarbell and the Muckrakers and Teddy Roosevelt. But Rockefeller gives us a pretty tree every year, so I guess we're all good. Now let's sum this up a little differently by asking some questions. Now the current animosity towards the rich, is it justified? I mean, being rich doesn't automatically make you evil the same way that being poor doesn't automatically make you good. Are these five captains of industry or robber barons? I mean, they all made their own fortune, and who are we to judge as we watch our PCs that were delivered to steel stores by road or rail while we wear fur coats? We've passed numerous regulations that will prevent monopolies and protect workers and the environment, but what does that mean for the third world? Is it right for the first world to set rules on burgeoning nations that they themselves never had to follow? Now these are all questions that you're going to have to answer for yourself. Be safe, and I'll see you next time. He drank your milkshake.